guys and welcome back to day two of the program of virtual virtuosos. I hope you enjoyed yesterday and I hope you'll enjoy today's um, activities that we have. Um, today we're going to have a group call at 2 p.m. If you'd like to join us, either introduce yourself, if you have any questions or anything like that, join us. I'll post the link for that um, and then we'll, I'll also post links for some activities for you guys to do. Um, today's scale of the day is G major. G major has one accidental, and that accidental is F sharp. So its relative minor is E minor, and I hope you guys have a chance to just practice that. Like I said, if it's just one octave, go for it. If it don't, you don't need to do two if that's too hard for you. Just keep it simple, but I want you guys to be able to do all these scales every single day. And the book that you have, this will, that's something you can follow and <clears throat> it will help you. So definitely use the scale books that you guys have. So what we're gonna talk about next is intervals. Intervals, why are they important? Um, so first off, as musicians, we use three out of the five senses. We use touch, hearing, and sight. We use sight for seeing our instrument and watching our bows, our fingers, where that's, those spots are. Sight is also helpful for when we look at um, music and when we look at other people in our ensemble, in our quartet, anything like that. Sight is very important. What also is important is touch. Touch, we um, use our fingers to um, to press on to get those notes. We use our fingers to put pressure into our bow. We pluck, we use our fingers to notate things in our music. So touch is very important. And if you're a musician that likes to close their eyes when they're memorizing a piece, touch is super, that's what you're relying on. You're relying now that you you um, tick out sight out of those senses, you are focusing on touch and, and your, your hearing, which is, really cool because then there's more focus on those two but the other one that we use is hearing hearing um we we listen for intonation we listen for our notes the sound quality of what we're getting we also listen if we're in, in an ensemble we are listening to other parts of the orchestra we are listening to our conductor anything like that hearing is i think one of the most important senses out of all for a musician so but anyways out of those five senses that we have those three are the most important so then touching back from hearing um, this is where we're going to talk and learn about ear training so we will be learning a few intervals every day for the rest of this week and train our ears um, intervals are often where we as musicians first encounter the idea of ear training and are doing focused exercises to improve our musical listening skills. So an interval is the distance and pitch between two notes. Intervals are the building blocks of relative pitch. What is relative pitch? Relative pitch is your sense of how high or how low a note is compared to another. Um, this is the sense of pitch that we rely on most often to understand, to create, and even just appreciate music. So relative pitch is a vital listening skill and intervals are just the building block of relative pitch. So why is interval ear training important? Well, the first reason is that interval ear training lets you identify intervals in music. So when you hear a pair of notes, you'll be able to recognize that interval. Let's say it's a perfect fourth. So you know how far apart they are in semitones, semi, and that's about five semitones apart. So this is useful when um, this is useful when you're trying, when you're either learning music or you're in you're in those stages. Um, it's a very vital. And another reason it's important is because uh, it's useful if you hear a melody and you want to play that on your instrument, you'll know which notes to play because of the intervals from the song that you know how it goes in your head. So identifying those intervals and connecting that to your instrument is why interval ear training is so important. Um, it's a very important skill when it comes to improvising. So improvising is when you're playing a bunch of notes on the spot that has to do with 
whatever song the band is playing or something of that sort. Um, so knowing the interval for different chords will help improvise on the spot and the more you do it the more it will become natural and easy. So um, relative pitch is a powerful skill for any musician to have and interval ear training is a fast way to acquire a sense a strong sense of relative pitch. So we're going to learn an uh, interval for every day for the rest of this week and today's intervals that we're going to learn is perfect one which is unison a minor second and a major second. So what's important when it comes to writing uh, intervals out is that just like for, for uh, what we went through the scales of, of circle of fifths, minor you want to use a small m, major you want to use a big m. You don't want to confuse those two, especially when it comes to intervals because we have minor second, major second. You want to make sure that you're using the right um, just capitalization of those letters, okay? So, a uh, easy way to learn inter intervals is from things we already know. So, um, we're gonna be we're gonna be comparing intervals to songs that you guys know. So that way you can recognize if you were to hear that interval, you're like, oh wait, I know it's from that song. So, for instance, perfect one in unison, we have happy birthday and jingle bells. So it's happy birthday. So from those two notes, remember an interval is between two notes. So happy, same note repeated twice. That is a perfect one or a unison. Um, jingle, that's again the same note. So this is how I can teach you intervals without even using an instrument because we have songs and that's going to be very helpful. I will um, show you on the piano what that looks like so that way you can get a it's going to be easier for you to see that because you can see the semitones and this, the, um, it makes sense how we count five and how we count one and all of that. So this is a perfect one. This is a unison. Now we have a minor second. Minor second, uh, the songs that you know for that is Jaws theme song. So, ba -da 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 -dum. and then we have Pink Panther theme song. Bottom, 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 bottom. So those are two popular songs that you would know. And this is what a minor second looks and sounds like. This is a minor second. Together. Next, we have a major second. Songs for those is Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mary. It's pretty much the next note. It's a whole step. And then um, we have happy birthday when it comes, happy birthday, that part of the song, happy birthday to you. And then we have silent nine, silent, those two first two notes. And then we have Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, so Rudolph, that's a whole step. And this is what that looks and sounds like. This is a major second. So I would challenge you to, to actually, you know, start listening today if you can identify intervals. So especially around the house, um, you can just, you can find those intervals like washing machines and dryers make the, they have a little melody that's played sometimes or they have beeping, um, dishwashers, coffee makers. Um, if you're watching a show, try to listen to that theme song and um, try to figure out what interval is or in your music. Um, that you're practicing, try to see if you can find a minor second or a major second. So minor second is a half step, major, uh, major second is a whole step, and perfect one unison is just the same note repeated. So try to identify that, and on today's group call, um, if you found something around the house or anything like that, maybe your alarm clock, your alarm ringtone, or whatever it is, like bring that example to class if you can record it so that way we can see what those intervals are and what you found because sometimes you'd be surprised if you hear a coffee maker what those intervals are anyway so next we're going to talk about our composer of the day who which is Mozart so Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart in full Johann Christoph Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was born in Salzburg Austria in 1756 
So Mozart was an Aust Austrian composer, and unlike any other composer in musical history, he wrote in all the musical genres of his day and excelled in every one. So usually composers are known for like their great operas, or this composer is known for his great concertos. This one is known for his sonatas. This one is known for his um, symphonies. Same thing, just like artists today, this person is known for country music. This person is known for rock, rap, whatever it is. So everyone is pretty much known for one genre. But Mozart was known for to be um, really popular in all of the genres of that were back in his day. So not a lot of composers are able to do that well. So Mozart's father, Leopold, came from a family of good standing, of which he was not so close with of bookbinders and architects. Um, Leopold was the author of a famous violin playing manual, which um, was published the very year that Mozart was born. So Mozart and his sister Ma Maria Anna were the only two of the seven children to survive. Mozart showed talent early on. At the age of three, Mozart was picking out chords on the harpsichord. Harpsichord um, is pretty much like a piano, but it only had one dynamic. So it's very, I'm pretty sure you've heard a uh, harpsichord being played before, but that's what a harpsichord is if you don't know. And at age four, he was playing short pieces on the harpsichord. And at age five, he was composing music already. He was a quick study. Mozart was so young when he wrote his first piece for violin and piano that he needed his father's help not to write the music but to hold the pencil. It's said that he was writing his own compositions by age five. So just before he was six, his father took him and his sister, who were highly talented, to Munich in Germany to play at the Bavarian court. And a few months later, they went to Vienna and were heard at the imperial court and in noble houses. So how compute composers made their wealth back then was either being um, employed by the church, by nobility, or by royalty. Composers either lived in residence at a court, so lived with the family of the royalty, or they were paid, so commissioned, to write pieces for people who wanted to play for that, pay for it. So when Mozart was only seven, he started a prolonged tour of Western Europe. So in three years, he went to Munich, Osberg, Stockard, Mannheim, Maine, Frankfurt, Brussels, Paris, London, Amsterdam, Lyon, Switzerland. Um, and then he arrived back in Salzburg after three years. So he pretty much went all over Germany. Um, he went to Paris, France, London, um, Amsterdam, Switzerland. So he went a lot of places at only the age of seven. And during those time, in most of those cities, often um, Mozart and often his sister played and improvised, sometimes at court and sometimes in public or in a church. In Paris, they met several German composers, and Mozart's first music was published, so sonatas for keyboard and violin. It was dedicated to a royal princess. In London, they met, among others, Johann Christian Bach, which was J.S. Bach's youngest son and a leading figure in the city's musical life. And under his influence, Mozart comp composed his first symphonies. Three of them survived. So he, Mozart had big ambitions, so he had a lot, he had big goals, big dreams, and shortly after Mozart started composing, he got serious. He wrote a major mass, and his first opera at only the age of 12, which is incredibly, um, it's just, that's incredible. A couple of facts about Mozart is that he loved shopping. <laughs> Mozart spent a lot of money on beautiful clothes beautiful clothing as an adult. So here's an example just of how much he spent on that. So one of the tenors, Michael Kelly, remembered one outfit that Mozart wore to rehearsal, and this is what Kelly said about that. Mozart was on stage with his crimson pelisse and gold laced cocked hat, giving the time of the music to the orchestra. So here's a picture of what that looks like, just to, just to see how like well-dressed Mozart was back in the day. 
Um, Mozart composed in short bursts throughout the day, so he didn't spend his whole day um, composing. He, he actually just did a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the afternoon, and a little bit at night. He was quite a night owl and didn't seem to need much sleep. Um, he made friends with all kinds of people, so Franz Joseph Haydn, who was another famous composer, was one of Mozart's friends. But Mozart also knew countless other musicians, performers, aristocats, and Salzburg residents who had a variety of jobs. Some of his closest friends were counts, scientists, and doctors. He had lots of pets. Um, Mozart had an unusual um, taste in house animals. So at different points in his life, he kept a canary, a starling, which is another type of bird, a dog, and a horse. So Mozart had a strange sense of humor. The jokes Mozart told as an adult were similar to the jokes today's young boys would laugh at. Some of us Austria's high society found his uh, humor kind of odd and just off-putting, so especially when combined with his taste for fine clothing. It was a bit, um, it was they were confused. Um, but his true friends either had similar tastes or found the jokes charming. Um, so music, uh, Mozart's musical influence were numerous, of course. Mu Mozart's first major influence with his, was his own father, Leopold, who taught him how to play the piano. But in his formative years, Mozart traveled all over Europe with his family to meet several composers. The most famous and probably most influential of them was Johann Christian Bach. So Mozart also spoke 15 languages. Great composers have always been citizens of the world, and since their commissions and gigs take them to far, um, far off locations, Mozart traveled extensively, not only as a child, but also as an adult composer in high demand. So he picked up language skills in almost every country of the world that he visited. By the time he was a teen, he'd probably already picked up German, French, English, Dutch, and Italian, if not more. Mozart was also extremely prolific. Thanks to his above-mentioned catalog, we know that Mozart composed more than 600 works in three and a half decades of his life. His whole body of work include 21 stage and opera works, 15 masses, more than 50 symphonies, 25 piano concertos, 12 violin concertos, 27 concert arias, 17 piano sonatas, and 26 string quartets. So, a lot of works. He always spoke his mind. Mozart worked regularly with Emperor Joseph II in this time as a composer. So, that emperor commissioned Mozart, so paid Mozart to write the opera Abduction from the Seraglio. But when he, um, but when the emperor heard the premiere, he complained that it was too fine for his ears and that there are too many notes. Without missing a beat, Mozart replied, there are just as many notes as there should be. <laughs> so I guess you could say that Mozart was sassy. We're also still not sure how um, he died. If Mozart wasn't poisoned, then how did he die? So uh, scholars still aren't sure. Some believe it had to do with Mozart's chronic vitamin D deficiency. Others blame medical malpractice and, and like toxic medications. Still others believe it was a brain hemorrhage, a brain bleed. But one of the most widely believed theories is that Mozart died of liver disease. He died at 35 years old. He was really young when he died. It was also rumored that Salieri poisoned Mozart because of the rivalry the two composers had. When Mozart fell ill and told his wife, Constance, that he felt as though he's been poisoned, she knew better than to believe her sick husband in his delirium. Salieri himself was the one that felt, fed the rumor mill after um, Mozart's death, and he confessed to having poisoned his colleague. It was later then that they found out that Sal Salieri was also sick and when he made that confession, so he was not in his right mind. Mozart's legend lives on through other composers' music. Though he never got those lessons he wanted, Beethoven heavily um, used Mozart's music for inspiration in his own compositions. Countless composers over the centuries have paid homage to M Mozart and his music, including Chopin, Glinka, Tchaikovsky. 
Mozart continues to be one of the most enduring and influential composers in history. And I'm pretty sure you know something of Mozart one way or another. So today's practice goal is to notice the intervals, perfect one, unison, minor two, and a major second throughout your core pieces and practice those intervals individually. So that way you can tell that it's a half step or a whole step or if it's the same note. And just notice those intervals in your music. And um, like I said, if you notice anything in your house or outside, definitely record it and show it to us so that way we can also see what you were able to notice. Um, yeah, so that's what we have for day two. Um, we hope to see you tomorrow and have a good one. Bye.